discussion around this, um, this topic and uh, we've posed two questions and if each table could nominate one person, there's a form on the table, um, if you could write down some of the comments that you're making, um, CETA are gathering all these comments and um, putting it together so these outcomes will be published um, um, at, yeah, at the end of the series and uh, uh, will be available on their website. So is offsite manufacture an inevitable consequence of BIM? And if so, what steps can the industry take to accelerate this? If you could have a think about that and discuss that. And where can significant gains be achieved through a production stroke manufacturing type philosophy in the, con in the construction industry? Table 11. I want to hop there. Hi, um, Mel McGurr from Murphy McGurr Heffernan. Um, on question one, we generally found that the uh, industry, industry needs to accept that this that it is now a digital process, as opposed to constructing, and we're manufacturing the building. Um, greater integration amongst the design team members and construction and supply chain, and that effectively we're designing the prototype and then manufacturing this prototype. Um, and we agree that, you know, off-site manufacture is an ine inevitable consequence of, of BAM, though there probably still is a place for a certain amount of traditional construction. Um, on question number two, um, again, going back to most of the things we found dealing with BAM, there, 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 there will, and has been evidenced here in today's presentation, like cost savings are inevitable, prevention of clashes uh, and reduction in waste. Um, one thing we thought, perhaps the existing prefab manufacturers could engage a bit more on a larger scale with the existing body of consultants to, uh, I know personally as an architectural consultant, I don't know a huge amount about what the likes of Kingsman Tech and these guys, how their details work. Um, and I have been trying to get in touch with some of these guys to come down to our office and show us exactly how they work so that we could be innovative in adopting their systems to do stuff like what was shown today. Um, that's something I think maybe is in the ball court of the various institutes maybe as, opposed, as well as um, approaching uh, Autodesk and various ones to provide BIM for, to the masses, maybe some of the prefabricated manufacturers out there might come and start doing the same thing so that we can get a bit more educated on, on their systems. And then, subsequently, the designers, the QSs, uh, ME guys can maybe inform on a greater basis their, um, uh, their systems and improve them. So I think that's pretty much Thank it. Thank you very much. Thanks, okay. Mel. What about table four? Have we got anything to add to that? Thank you. Um, John Daly, Mulcahy McDonough. We're uh, at our table. We have um, contractors, clients, engineers, QS, architects. Um, in regard to question one, we felt really that um, BIM is more a facilitator for off-site manufacturer, off-site manufacturer. And we felt that obviously where repeat buildings are involved, then off-site manufacturer is relevant and as is BIM, of course. In dealing with steps that the industry can take, we thought that um, a more coordinated approach right at the beginning, of course, is very helpful. Uh, a holistic approach to the building itself, the emphasis on time spent on the brief, we felt was very important, and perhaps more at the beginning, we felt certainly the education of the client base is important in the sense of uh, enabling the client to understand the benefit of BIM and so on. Uh, we didn't really get as far as question number two, I'm afraid, but the discussion on question number one was quite a lot. Thank you. Anybody else who wanted to add to that? Table number three. Morning, Jerry Sherman of Artelli Ireland. Um, just in relation to question uh, one, 
um, our kind of general thoughts were that uh, the importance of the, using BIM at the, the earliest stage uh, from a, pre, a briefing point of view with the client uh, and you know that the client understands it and then the client maybe buys into the BIM philosophy and approach so it permeates down to consultants and it's built into fees etc so that it's there from the initiation and the 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 the, the, the the plus values are, are demonstrated, including kind of dollarizing it at, a, at, a, at, the, at the earliest stage, I think is important to, to get the, uh, the, the buy-in from the client. The other areas, I suppose, regarding what aspects of construction, I, I don't think everything will, will, will go to, and obviously can't go to off-site construction, but certainly things like if there's pods, if there's plant rooms, uh, Etc. I think they're they're ideal kind of probably high value, high high quality uh, items that can be manufactured in a factory rather than kind of on a, on a, on a sixth floor of a on a windy day or a rainy day, etc. In relation to um, item uh, question two, I suppose just coming from my own experience, having spent maybe 24 years on the construction side, uh, uh, production on site, it's really. I think the critical thing is to compare apples with apples. Uh, you, you know, we say on-site construction, when the costs are being done, that it's, it's kind of a very experienced uh, set of hands that put the allocation of costs for indirect costs, like uh, additional supervision, uh, you know, lack of sequences, wastage, etc. So that's all factored in because they're huge. Uh, indirect costs, and that that then it's apples with apples. Uh, bottom line costs are, are are compared. You know, thank you. Okay, Anybody else? We've got table six. Do you have anything to add to that? I, I just suppose our main point from question one was that the caution about losing craft skills, such as brickwork and stonework, just if everything were to become or we were to move towards um, high off-site manufacture. And then on question two, just in terms of materials, Ireland imports a lot of materials, such as stone from China and lime, um, from coal originating from Vietnam, such that it would have to be something that would be factored into how that BIM reduces the carbon, but where do the, the materials and so on come from? I suppose in terms of question one, we really sort of, uh, other people have sort of addressed the same comments that we had on question one. On question two, where can the significant gains be achieved? Um, obviously through component level um, design or standardized design. Um, Off-site construction, obviously going back to the first question. Um, in terms of speed of erection, just working out, you know, shorter program and reducing the construction time and less waste. Um, and just in terms of sort of things that, that may get in the way of some of these um, things happening, uh, one person who made the point that the, uh, the five-year political cycle tends to uh, restrict so, some of the, uh, the opportunities for getting these gains because people are not going to be around um, long enough to actually see some of these projects come to fruition. Anybody else? Any other comments? Just not to repeat uh, what people have said before, one of the things we spotted uh, is, is the actual capital investment <laughs> issues. Uh, obviously, if you're dealing with 25 hospitals, you're not dealing with the same animal as you know, a number of small domestic dwellings. Uh, so the capital investment and the volume and, reliable, uh, and repeatability is, is very key to getting all of those upfront costs, uh, making them sustainable. Um, we thought that uh, tolerances were the one thing that BIM really does deliver on, um, and once you deal with once once we've cracked the tolerance issue, we can we can get two spaceships to join together in the in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, we we can surely get a, ca a cabinet to fit into a, an alcove. Um, um, in terms of the second question, we thought that there was uh, obviously time and uh, schedule were, go were, were going to be improved. Um, defects reduction and quality optimization was, was the major benefits. Um, waste avoidance, we think, is going to be significant in terms of sustainability and carbon issues and all those kind of things, um, and other loss reductions. Um, and the possibility of getting for increasing sophistication 
that we can actually move the building industry up the value chain by increasing the complexity. Um, the other thing was that we actually do need a lot of training in design for manufacture. And uh, so that's the agenda. Okay. Um, want to make a final comment, Jamie? Uh, yeah. Is this working? Can yes. you hear that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that's all really useful, interesting feedback, actually, because obviously I've been, I've been doing this for a long time, so um, I sort of forget sometimes what it's like being a, you know, a normal architect. I work with lots of normal architects on Athletes with Engine and Terminal 2 and things, but it's, it's always useful to get the kind of feedback. Um, there was a couple of good points, I think. It's all made a comment about um, traditional skills and traditional materials over there. Um, I don't think by any means that we will turn the entire industry into a, um, a product-based manufacturing type, type system. I think we've got to try and do as much as possible. Certainly in the UK, those traditional skills are, are dying out and all they're incredibly expensive. And so, yeah, I think we'll always need people that can do those things. I think we'll always need those kind of craft-based things. I think there's always going to be, going to be a market for that. Um, but actually, it, need, it needs to be applied, as I say, where it's really adding value, where you really need those skills and not just because it's, you know, that, that's the way you do things. Um, some of the other comments I think about tolerances and things, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. It's one of the things we, we battle with all the time. Um, uh, I think there is, at the moment, yes, we're lucky that we're working with people like Circle. We're working with clients that have big scale, big volume. One of the things we're trying desperately to do is leverage the stuff we're doing and turn it into you know, mass customizable things in some way. So one of the things we were talking on our table about is whether you can actually scale this up to whether we have to be working with particular architects or particular designers to make this work. And I don't think we do on schools now, for instance. We don't even give them the rule book. We say, you just design your best school and we can turn that into a manufacturable product because the, because the system is now so mass customizable. The ones on Circle are, are quite um, rigid. For other clients, we do very kind of flexible systems. So I think there's, there is a real trick. and We don't know how to do this yet, but in um, in, the, the point this gentleman made at the back about engaging the, the manufacturers to bring them to the table and say, look, how, ca how much can we stretch the rules? How much can we bend the rules? How close do we have to get to your idealised solution before you can meet us halfway? Part of it is in designers embracing those type of things and part of it is in yeah, working on systems that are flexible enough that you can see the, kind of the, the printed circuit board type things we showed you. That could have been anything, happened to be a, a hospital, but we could almost do that as a you know, completely one-off office building or anything now because once you've got the system then that that's kind of you know, a fair, fairly flexible thing uh, so yeah there's you're raising all the questions that we're constantly thinking about and we're trying to get on to the next level there was one other point someone made about the um the costing thing as well which i think is quite quite interesting that um i think there has to be a next generation of qs's mm -hmm. that know how to price this stuff because the moment we, we really struggle with any individual bit of off-site manufacture Certainly, traditionally, on its own, was probably more expensive. Um, and it only makes sense when it's planned in. So, for instance, when something's taking time out of the critical path or where it's mopping up all the high-value um, interface heavy bits, then that's where you really start to get it. QSs don't understand that a module is a bit of structure and it's a bit of services and it's a bit of finishes and it's a bit of dry lining and maybe a bit of cladding and a bit of roofing and all the rest of it. Their cost plans aren't set up to drag those individual bits out and put a, put a price to things. Uh, my hope is that the next generation of QSs will understand how the models are put together, so they trust the data's there, understand how to fill in the gaps, and understand that yeah, DFMA is part of a, a wider system, and yet you do have to pick up all of the, the other intangibles that come with it and understand really that it's you know, what the factory cost is versus what you're spending on site and all the other bits, and it's, an, it's a new field, and QSs have been really bad at picking that up, and I'm hoping that they're going to start getting better, because we were talking about you know, what QSs must think of BIM, they must be shitting at the moment, and I really, I really hope that um, they've either got to engage with this and learn how to work in a BIM-enabled world, or they've just got to move out of the way, because someone else is going to come and start. Um, in the way that architects gave away lots of power, I think QSs are about to find a load of the stuff they do is just going to get mopped up by people who are doing the models or the contractors or whatever it is, and they're going to have to start finding a new, new value proposition. As a QS, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> Someone responsible for, for QSing in Bolton Street. I, just to reassure you, Jamie, a lot has been done uh, in the colleges around the country in regard to educating not only conscious affairs, but other professions in BIM. And actually, 
the larger percentage of our students on the MSc programmes are quantity surveyors. Uh, not just because they know me, because that they believe this is the future, you know. Uh, any construction business needs quantity surveyors, I'm convinced of that, as experts in, in managing cost. Can I take this opportunity in thanking Jamie for an absolutely stonkingly good presentation? Well done. <laughs> Congratulations. I don't know and, how many thank times... thank you again for having me. <laughs> I don't have many times to use the words Bosch. Maybe Bosch and Vim <laughs> are, are synonymous with each other. We've had a number of very positive comments from, through Twitter. One of our directors um, said it was absolutely mind-blowing stuff, uh, absolutely fantastic presentation. It probably is one of the best presentations, not the best presentation we've had in the series so far, and we've had some very, very good ones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I also take the opportunity to thank you for coming along this morning in this cloudy grey summer day. Um, 54 of you were in the room and another 52 of you were online and that's absolutely fantastic for July. Uh, maybe something to do with the weather, I'm not sure. Uh, and also to thank Ralph Montagu. What can I say about Ralph Montagu? Ralph has put thousands of hours into this drive for BIM in Ireland, all behind the scene, all voluntary, uh, and I just want to personally say thank you today to Ralph for his contributions uh, and I know that his day will come. He will get a reward for all of this in the future. Thank you Ralph and for your excellent chairmanship this morning. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, without you we wouldn't be able to have events like this and indeed the wider seated team, Suzanne, uh, who always amazes me with her ability to multitask and, for, and also uh, to Barbara for her, her, excellent, uh, her excellent work. Um, the BIM series, I believe, has been a great success. And we want to keep it going. And we're taking a little break for August. And uh, we're returning in September. But we have an ambition in September to invite a certain gentleman known as James Salmon from the US to come here, not only to talk about you know, real examples of driving BIM uh, in a contractual setting, but also to meet interested stakeholders, be they charter surveyors, be they chartered engineers, be they chartered builders, be they government departments and so on. But we have a certain level of restriction with our funding in that um, we're only allowed to, to pay for domestic and UK flights. So we have a number of people who are supporting the series, uh, the, the visit of James, um, the OPW, I know the Society Charter Surveyors are looking at this, the Association of Consultant Engineers of Ireland, the RII, and, and others. But if there's any people in this room representing a group, be it the CIOB or the National Development Finance Agency, that have 100 euros, 200 euros, 400 euros that can contribute to this cost, I think it will be very beneficial. Because we need people like James Salmon to show us the way in which we should be uh, organizing our contracts. It's a little bit ambitious. It's the most ambitious we've uh, um, yet, and there is a cost associated with it. And so I'll be, and Suzanne and Ralph, will be busily trying to see if we can make this happen on the 26th of September. But time is not on our side. We need to get more support. So anyone out there, if you're a member, if you're an IT company, help us make this happen on the 26th of September. We've got about two to three weeks to, to, before we have to book flights and so on. We're inviting back David Phelps in November to wrap the series up and to share with us the outputs of all these demonstration projects in the UK. And also, we could coincide that with a, perhaps a, a delegation from the UK meeting a delegation in Ireland of policy makers and policy deciders in this whole area. <laughs> Because we believe that uh, the Irish government have to do something. They have to step forward. And we believe that we can build a very proactive Irish BIM Council, centre of excellence for BIM. And that CETA could be centrally involved in that. Um, the master's degree, just for those of you who are maybe sitting on the fence or uh, uh, joining us in September, it's going to kick off in September. And uh, a lot of these speakers that you've seen today and, and other days, you'll see them again. Um, we're close to viability at the moment with 10, 8 to 10 students. We'd like to get another three or four 
to make it viable, you know, take that leap of faith if you're thinking about it. Because I believe the students, one or two of which are here today will be graduating in September, will be the future innovators in this industry. And the course is specifically designed to teach you and to educate you to do exactly what Jamie was talking about today. And it's a unique program, it's, it's online, it's, uh, it's, you can do it in, in, in as I say, uh, at any geographic location in the world if you so wish. It's co-funded by, sponsored by, by Skillnets, and uh, it's got some superb lectures on it. And not only, you know, graduates, but companies need to be thinking about placing their employees in these courses strategically and soon to, so that they can be ready for the upturn. Just before I finish, uh, again, if any of you are thinking about membership, you know, every member we get strengthens the alliance. It's like a chain. Every member that joins us strengthens the network, and it strengthens our position when we talk to the Irish state, the Irish government, about, you know, over 10 years ago, there was a call to develop a, an innovation centre for construction. It was found at that time not to be feasible. Why? Because the private sector were doing extremely well, and there was no need for the Irish state to step in. Life is different now. The industry is now retracting. It's now time for the Irish state to step up and to support this initiative and drive it forward. I'm hoping that in September, we can sit down with our event partners that built this series, driven by Ralph, and build a new series for 2013. That's important that we continue this momentum and perhaps push it out to the regions uh, as we move into 2013. So just to wrap up, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Ralph, for an excellent morning.